following. It's just stuck in my mind and kept it for these couple of months. Our travels are highlighted by qualities that are increasingly rare in our fast-paced, divisive Western world. Gratitude, grace, and hope. Our travels are highlighted by qualities that are increasingly rare in our fast-paced, divisive Western world. Gratitude, grace, and hope. This ad was for a Vail Symposium lecture by two young women who work for an outfit called the Central Asia Institute. Uh, Karen and I are quite familiar with the Central Asia Institute. Uh, it was founded by a gentleman who believed that peace can come through education. So his mission was to go into rural, remote, dangerous villages in Pakistan and Afghanistan and build schools. Not build schools for them, to go in and work with the elders and have them want a school. School for girls, to educate girls in this culture, in this very hostile land. So it's a really wonderful group, but I was wondering, struck by this quote, why these two women, after traveling in those places, would say, gratitude, grace, and hope are so increasingly rare in our world. And I wonder, are they really that rare? And if not, where can we find those qualities? I'd like to start by looking back at our scriptures today. Just each of them is a good illustration for us of one of these qualities. The Genesis scripture was about Abraham, God's blessing to Father Abraham. As I mentioned to the kids earlier in the, in the Genesis stories, God speaks to Abraham and makes a promise to him. And it says, He, Abraham, believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. <coughs> Let's be clear what righteousness really is. It's not self-righteousness. I'm so good. Piousness. It's a condition of being right with God. So Abraham, through his faith, became right with with God. And what a story of faith it is. As we go through that story into today's story and then into the future passages in Genesis, Abraham never wavers in his faith. He dares to act as God wants him to act. He dares to trust that God will deliver on his promises. So what is it about our Western world that could be counter to that? What is the greatest enemy in faith? What's the greatest enemy? It's doubt. Is it not the struggle between faith and doubt? C.S. Lewis dealt with this in this beautiful book called The Screwtape Letters. Anybody familiar with this? Written back in the 1940s. Screwtape is the devil, and he's writing letters to his nephew, Wormwood, advising him on how to deal with poor old me and keep me from becoming a Christian. And way before today's modern, fast-paced, divisive world, he says that, you know, with the weekly press and other weapons, he's taking on the media. But back then, our man has become accustomed ever since he was a boy to having a dozen incompatible philosophies dancing about in his head. He doesn't think of doctrines as primarily true or false, but as academic or practical or outworn or progressive or contemporary. Jargon not argument is your best ally. Don't waste time trying to make him think that materialism is true. Make him think it is strong or stark or courageous. That's the philosophy of the future. That's the sort of thing he cares about. So even as far back as 60, 70 years ago, Lewis is saying, doubt is the enemy of faith. Last week, Father Brooks had a beautiful sermon. Does anybody remember the main theme of the sermon, what we're supposed to do? Let's see the Lord sermon. above all others. Oh, oh yeah. Well, Karen said, gosh, she got a lot of chuckles. I mean, she had an excuse she wasn't in church last Sunday. She was in Sunday school. So. He said, We need to concentrate on hearing the voice of God above all other <coughs> voices. God does not sow doubt. Satan sows doubt. If we're listening to God's voice, it's not going to be a, a message of doubt. So 
Lent, this time of the year, calls us to turn to God, to repent, to examine our lives, and to look at what is it in our lives that interfere with our hearing God's voice, and to get rid of those things. But where am I going with this? What does it have to do with those qualities? Do you think a doubting person can truly and honestly say, thanks be to God? Is there any doubt of what Abraham's reaction to God would have been beyond faith and trust when he was promised a son at this advanced age of almost 100 years old? It's not too hard to imagine that Abraham would say thank you to God. Abraham would express gratitude. So my point number one is expressions of gratitude flow naturally from faith and trust in God. Our next reading in Romans, Paul picks up this theme. He picks it up and connects us with the story of Abraham. And why is that important other than connecting us? The message that Paul is delivering here, the point he's making is that the promise to Abraham, if you look right at the text, it's clear on that. The promise to Abraham came as a message of grace, not as a demand of the law. <clears throat> if it came as a demand of the law, it would have depended on Abraham to uphold the law and to fulfill it. And it would have perished as quickly as our good intentions to do better and be better and live more closely with Christ perish with every day as we struggle to do that. So what Paul says here, it now depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants and here's our connection. Grace includes all who share Abraham's trust in God. Abraham's a beautiful example for us of faith. It's never wavering. Even in the face of the media screaming evil, sin pervades and rules the world. It doesn't mean, however, that simply because we are justified by faith and saved by grace, that we're to be passive observers. When I was in college or first married, there was a slim book I, I, I looked for it on my shelf, but I couldn't find it real quickly. Ever, anybody ever read the Gospel According to Peanuts? It was a great use of Peanuts cartoons to in, illustrate in this book the points of Scripture that came through up there. And the one that I remember when I think about this passive observer thing is, is for Snoopy or somebody sitting there in the cold, shivering, the snow's coming down, and here come Linus and Lucy, bundled up in their big coats, and they, Snoopy, be of good cheer. Yes, Snoopy, be of good cheer. And they walked on by. We're not called to be passive observers. It, what this passage does mean is, for us in life, is ordering our lives and the good things that we do in the framework of trust in God and bases his promise and grace. So my point number two is realization of grace, our realizing, other people realizing God's grace flow naturally from faith and trust in God. And then third, Mark's gospel, Jesus is teaching us two things here. The first one is pretty obvious right at the beginning when he says that he must suffer and die and be buried and raised on the third day. He's talking about the resurrection. He's also talking about the fact that the role of the Messiah that the disciples expected, an earthly, kingly warrior God to get rid of the Romans, was not God's plan, but a human idea. Peter was not listening to the voice of God. He was still clinging to this earthly warrior Messiah. And Jesus rebukes him and says, you're thinking about human things, not the divine plan. 
The second point that Jesus brings out is that following him requires us to deny ourselves. <coughs> Repent, yes, but also believe the good news. Believe as Abraham believes and act as Abraham acted. In total faith and trust in God, walking with God. Ordering our lives as we reflect during Lent. Letting go of those things that get in the way of our walk with God. Taking on those things that draw us nearer to God. Is what Jesus is saying to us. Jesus is affirming life, life to its fullest, living in the sunshine, walking with God, using our gifts and talents so that they don't wither. And when we do so, we develop them think, into something that's greater, greater than that. So where's the hope in this story? Well, the hope is in two places. It's in the resurrection, of course, and in our ultimate salvation, but it's also in Jesus' call to us to claim fully and live into the promise of God, living in eternal life now, a richer and fuller life that we can only find by denying ourselves and serving others. That is the whole gospel message, that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So are these qualities of gratitude, grace, and hope actually that rare in this fast-paced, divisive Western world? I think not. Not when we walk in the faithfulness of God. Not if we're looking in the right places. May I share with you just a short list of places I have seen these qualities and where you too may have been with me to see them. I think we've all seen them right in this room. In faces of people and expressions that they make, their reactions. We've seen them out there at the coffee hour. I say we, meaning you, me, all of us collectively, not just this is what the clergy see from standing up here. I was reminded in Baal, they show up at the prayer show ministry. I forgot to put that one on the list. They show up in our curriculum Bible studies. They show up every Thursday night at the community supper right in this room. They're exhibited by a hospital bed, in the emergency room, sitting at the bedside of a person who's dying, talking with a family of someone who recently died. We've seen them, you and me and several other people in this room, seen them in the streets of New Orleans. In the pre-dawn darkness outside the church in Slidell, when Barbara Hogan moved with this woman from across the street come together in the middle of the street. Total strangers. We've seen them on the Indian Reservation in South Dakota with the youth in the faces of the little Indian kids. We've seen them in the home of a single father in Bridge City, Texas. I could go on, and you can probably add many of your own experiences where expressions of gratitude, realization of God's wonderful grace, and expectations of hope for our lives in the future come on. So, in closing, my prayer for you this Lenten season is that in your journey to turning to God, in letting go of those things which distract you and putting on those things that draw you nearer to God. But this will lead you to step out into the world following Christ, serving others. And I believe that when you do that in service to others, the qualities of gratitude, grace, and hope will show themselves and you'll realize they're really not as rare as these two women in their travels elsewhere came back and thought that. Thank mm -hmm. you.